Okay, let's talk more about Henry's Law, which states that the amount of gas which dissolves in a liquid is proportional to two things. The partial pressure of the gas. We know that each of the different gases, whether it be oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, or water, has a different partial pressure of the total atmospheric pressure. And then something we need to understand called solubility. How easy does it move from one medium such as air to another medium such as liquid? Or from liquid back to air? How easy does it move through from one medium to the other? Now, looking at oxygen, obviously one of the gases that we're really concerned about because that's what we're trying to inhale because that actually, out of all the air, that does the most for us as far as why we breathe air. Now, looking at this particular picture, what we have is we have an equilibrium of oxygen on either side, meaning that since it's at equilibrium, it's not going to move uh, in a net direction, one or the other. So if we wanted to move more oxygen from the air into the water, we would have to add a pressure to it. We'd have to add a pressure to actually squeeze it into the water. Here we see we put our weight here to increase pressure. So now we're increasing pressure on the oxygen here and we're forcing it. The more pressure we're putting, the more we're forcing it to go from this medium of air into this medium of fluid. And of course, the when I say air, I mean space, okay? But uh, so, so our alveoli have space in them. Our blood has plasma. So our oxygen would have to cross from the space in the alveoli into the fluid of the plasma. It would need a certain amount of pressure to do that. Now, if we just put this amount of pressure, then we force a certain amount across there, and, and then the, it would quit running back and forth once, you know, we, once we reached equilibrium again. If we put more pressure, it would keep running until it reached equilibrium again, but we'd have less space, more pressure. So again here, with this much pressure we put on here, we actually have a certain amount of pressure exerted to where it reached equilibrium. Well, let's see if carbon dioxide has the same solubility as oxygen. In other words, does the same amount of pressure cause it to reach equilibrium at the same time, or are they different solubilities, meaning a different amount of pressure would be needed for it to reach equilibrium? Well, notice now that we have the same amount of pressure for both of these. Notice how this fluid is darker, meaning that we actually squeezed more carbon dioxide into this under the same pressure, meaning that this had a lower solubility or, or a higher solubility. In other words, it moved across from one medium of space into, or air into this medium of, of a fluid. Okay, so under the same pressures, this, we can move as many oxygen molecules from one medium to the other as we could carbon dioxide. Therefore, what we take from this is carbon dioxide is much more soluble. It moves easier than oxygen does. So now what that means then is I need less pressure to move oxygen across than, ox than, uh, than excuse me, to move carbon dioxide across than oxygen. So I'm always going to have a different pressure, different pressure gradient moving it across than the pressure gradient that I would need for oxygen. Okay, so looking at this, although both gases have the same pressure, more carbon dioxide dissolves into the liquid. So if I could repeat this a thousand times, I would repeat it a thousand times. Carbon dioxide is much more soluble than oxygen. It moves across from one medium to the other much easier. Notice more of this moved across in the same pressure than this. So I need a bigger pressure difference here if I'm going to move a lot of oxygen across, where I don't need as big a pressure difference here because it moves across much easier. Okay, so we have two different types of respiration. We have internal respiration, which is what we talked about uh, last semester, and we talked about cellular respiration, the Krebs cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, glycolysis, all those things, but uh, the internal respiration dealing with basically what was going on in the cell and the mitochondria. But now we're keying in a little bit more on external respiration, what's going on at the alveoli. Again, here's our pulmonary arteries going away and branch down into capillaries, our pulmonary veins picking up the oxygenated blood, taking them back to the left side of the heart. And of course, 
this external respiration means we're getting air uh, into and out of the body and trying to get more oxygen in and more carbon dioxide out. Notice here's our respiratory zone where we have our alveoli, our alveolar sacs here, our terminal bronchioles going down to them, uh, our respiratory bronchioles uh, with where we start having our alveoli on it. So there's our terminal bronchiole up through here. Okay, now uh, we've got three main factors that this external respiration is dependent upon. The first factor is the surface area. We need a lot of surface area. Uh, and it needs to be extremely thin. This respiratory membrane has to be extremely thin because we have to diffuse oxygen from the ins inside of the alveoli, the space, into the blood on these capillaries here. But there has to be a lot of surface area so we can attach a lot of blood vessels to it. We have to have the partial pressure gradients. In other words, things, if we're at equilibrium, we're not going to move air one way or the other. So we've actually got to have a difference in the pressure of the air when it's in the space of the alveolus versus the pressure of the air, whether that be carbon dioxide or oxygen, either one. There has to be a difference in the pressure of the carbon dioxide and oxygen in the blood versus the carbon dioxide and oxygen in the, the actual space of the alveoli. And finally, we got to match the airflow to the blood flow because it doesn't do us any good to get a bunch of, of air down here if we can't get it into the blood. So I've got to somehow figure out how to get blood to the places I've got the most air going to and maybe even shun it away from areas that aren't getting as much air. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Okay, here we see the space inside the alveoli. We know they're connected because we're this tube, but we know we also have all the surface area of cells so we can have all these capillaries around it. So we have a large area to exchange uh, oxygen into the blood and carbon dioxide out of the blood. So let's look at what one of them looks like. Okay, here's one alveoli with all the, the uh, simple squamous epithelial cells that make it up. Again, we see a capillary running next to it. There's another capillary. There's another capillary because ultimately we've got to exchange the oxygen from here into the blood, the carbon dioxide from here into the alveolus. We're inhaling that oxygen. We're exhaling that that uh, carbon dioxide. So look, we we have a starting place here. We have a partial pressure of oxygen of 104 millimeters of mercury, partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 40 millimeters of mercury, and a partial pressure of water of 47 millimeters of mercury. Okay, now notice our partial pressure in the alveoli is 104, but in the atmosphere it was 159. Remember our partial pressure, it was this is this is if we're at sea level and it was 760 overall. We got 159 here, but only 104 here. Okay, uh, and so why is that? Why do we have more here than here? Well, part of that is because as soon as it gets here, it automatically starts going into the blood. The red area here shows its blood that's being oxygenated. So we're automatically going to lose part of that pressure because as, again, as this 159 comes down through here, it automatically starts leaving. So it lowers the partial pressure. Okay, carbon dioxide is actually actually coming in this way. So the little bit of carbon dioxide that came in, now we're basically building up the carbon dioxide levels so it will go back out. Uh, another thing is, remember one of the purposes of breathing through our nose and our mouth is to do two things, warm and humidify the air. So whereas I only have, you know, this very small partial pressure of water in the atmosphere, by the time it gets down here to the alveoli, because it's passing through these these fluid line passages, then my partial pressure of, ox of, of water has actually grown quite a bit. And of course, we want to keep a moist surface. We want to obviously keep our surfactant in that to break up the surface tension of the water molecules, but we definitely want a warm surface. Drying out your lungs is one of the most unhealthy things you can do. That's one reason why smoking, whether it be cigarettes or other things, can be really bad for your lungs. Okay, so let's look at oxygen and notice that our partial pressure of oxygen was 104 millimeters of mercury because it's leaving. All right, but what we're really concerned with is the pressure gradient difference between the partial pressure of oxygen that's in the space of the alveoli versus the, the partial pressure of oxygen that's still in the blood. 
Remember, blood is never totally depleted of oxygen. It can be oxygen rich, as we see over here, or oxygen poor, but it's always got some oxygen in it. So we will have some partial pressure. Now it can drop down to a partial pressure of 40. So notice then, if I have a partial pressure of 40 here and a partial pressure of 104 here, then it's going to go from the high to the low. Therefore, it's going to start crossing in very quickly uh, from the blood that's coming in here with the low partial pressure to the blood to the the of oxygen to the air with a high partial pressure of oxygen. It's going to start going from the high towards the low until it reaches equilibrium. Okay, so oxygen coming in this alveolus goes into this capillary at this point until it reaches equilibrium. It's not going to go higher than 104 because then it would have to start going back the other way. So it will continue to come in here until it reaches equilibrium with our highest amount, which which was uh, 104. So, so this went from 40 to 104 because the partial pressure of the oxygen caused it to rise to that to reach equilibrium. Okay, looking at our graph here, here is the partial pressure of oxygen here at the capillaries, bringing the, the oxygen poor blood in. And then as soon as the oxygen starts filling it up, notice how we have this, what's called an S-shaped curve, how we have the sudden rise until we reach 104, because we can't go higher than 104, because again, once we reach what the pressure is, then we've reached equilibrium and we level off. Now we carry the, the partial pressure of oxygen at 104 until it gets to our tissues. Now carbon dioxide, on the other hand, is has a partial pressure in the alveoli of 40, but in the blood of 45. So since it's higher here than here, it's certainly going to go from high to low. But I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that there's not a lot of difference between 40 and 45. It, it's still important that it's not the same, or there would, if it was 40 on both, it'd be equilibrium. It wouldn't move either way. But since it's higher here than here, it's going to move from here to there. Okay, but there's only five millimeters of mercury difference. But in the when we were looking at the oxygen, it went from 104 to 40. And why is it why is there such a big difference? Well, again, it goes down to which one is more soluble. Well, carbon dioxide is much more soluble, so I don't need as much of a pressure difference for it to move. Oxygen's not near as soluble. It takes a lot more pressure difference for it to move. Okay, so that's why we have such a big difference in the pressure gradients between when carbon dioxide will move with only a five millimeter of mercury difference and oxygen moving with 104 and uh, 40 difference, which we'll look at here in just a second. By the way, really important that you understand, if you see the term loading or unloading, it's always in reference to the blood. Either we are unloading from the blood or we are loading into the blood. So if you see the term that says loading or unloading, always say it's in reference to what's going on with the blood. It's not talking about what's going on in the alveoli. We're not saying unloading from the alveoli. We're always saying unloading from the blood. If we were to say loading, we'd be saying loading into the blood. So it's always in reference to the blood. So make sure you know that terminology because it's going to be on the test. Okay, looking at this graph, notice our carbon dioxide starts out with a partial pressure of 45 millimeters of mercury, and then it moves to 40 millimeters of mercury, and then it hits equilibrium. So notice again how fast that occurred from here to here. It, lo it lost it, but remember at the same time it was also gaining oxygen. But as far as just carbon dioxide is concerned, notice we went from 45 to 40 because we reached equilibrium here. So that meant that oxygen left here, or excuse me, Carbon dioxide left here, not oxygen. Carbon dioxide left here, and carbon dioxide reached equilibrium on both sides of the respiratory membrane. So looking at the graph again, because we know carbon dioxide's unloading and oxygen's loading, and all that's always in reference to what's going on in the blood, it's all happening at the same time. But what we want to recognize is our partial pressure of oxygen was 40 here. It was 104 here. There's a big difference between 104 and 40, a big pressure difference. But I need that big pressure difference because oxygen is much less soluble. It's harder for it to move across from this medium into that medium. Carbon dioxide has a partial pressure in the in this blood of 45. So it's going to move out because it only has partial pressure of 40 here in the alveolus. 
Well, there's, that's a much less of a difference. Why? It has a higher solubility. It moves very easily across those surfaces.